Hi, I'm Dr. John Aquaviva, Professor of Exercise Science at Wingate University, and welcome to this edition of The Fitness Doctor. For over 20 years, I've been involved in fitness and exercise, both as a professor and a practitioner. My aim is to help people improve their fitness, weight management, and overall health. Over the past 20 years or so, people have been bombarded with information on all issues involving health, in particular from TV and the internet. While most of this information is correct and indeed helpful, some is confusing or downright wrong. On this series, we take a closer look at some of the myths surrounding fitness, dieting, and general health. To help me correct some of these myths, I want to welcome back to the show Heather Delange, the wellness coordinator here at Wingate University. Welcome, Heather. Thank you for having me. Uh, now, Heather, before we get into these, uh, these myths and uh, dispelling these myths, mm -hmm. um, t tell the audience again uh, what your role is here at the university. All right, well, I'm the wellness coordinator at Wingate University, so I have two roles. The first one is just creating programs for faculty and staff to improve their health. And that's both finding out what the needs are from the faculty and staff, what health problems we see, and then also what interests faculty and staff ha have, and then combine them together to create a program that's effective. Sure. And then my second part is teaching PE 101 classes. So that's really kind of trying to share my passion with fitness and exercise to students at Wingate. Sure. Um, we do that through different labs and lectures, and so it's very fun. <laughs> Good. Now, uh, before we even get into the myths, mm -hmm. uh, which, which of those aspects of your job do you have to dispel myths more often? Dealing with the faculty and staff and kind of like one-on-one -on -one talks or in, in, those group, um, in those group programs you have, mm -hmm. or in the PE 101 class? Well, that's a good question. If you would ask me maybe you know, a couple months ago, I would have said faculty and staff, just because you do have so much more intimate conversations with them where they're actually telling you this is what I think and this is what I know. Yeah. But when I did the class evaluations with the PE 101 students, a lot of people wrote in their evaluations, well, you know, I didn't know how to eat healthy. I never knew how to read a um, nutrition label or I thought diet pills were the only way to go to lose weight. So then reading those evaluations, I learned that it's across the board. It doesn't matter how old you are, what gender you are, you know, if you're an athlete or not, people still have, you know, myths and they don't know what's true and what's not true. And I almost think it's because we're bombarded with so much information. That's right. You know, you have Dr. Oz or magazines is always, this is the newest information, this is the right. newest, you know, effective health method, and you just don't know what to believe. And, and you probably would agree with me that most of it is probably correct, but th mm -hmm. they receive so much information from kind of like different angles. Mm -hmm. And not only that, it's kind of explained in different ways, so it really confuses folks. Mm -hmm. So uh, I, I know that there's a lot of people watching right now, and they have questions too. Mm -hmm. So um, let's get into the, the first myth. And I, the first one has to do with calories in and calories out. So mm -hmm. let's talk about that. Tell us what the myth is, and then start to dispel it. All right, well, people think, and the thing with calories in, calories out, is the true statement in, in there is that 3,500 calories is a pound. So if you want to lose one pound a week, you need to have a deficit throughout the week of 3,500 calories. That's right. So that is the truth in there. And I think people think, well, you know, that means I only have to eat 500 less calories a day. So, you know, that's really great. I can eat whatever I want as long as it's 500 less than what I need. So, for example, let's say that you need about... 2,000 calories a day, and mm -hmm. you're trying to eat 500 less, yep. so you want to create a meal plan that's under 1,500 calories. That's right. So we did that in one of my PE classes, and mm -hmm. the students were like, you know, I'll still have my hash browns and sausage patties for breakfast. I'm going to have one piece of pizza for lunch and a Big Mac meal for dinner, and I'm at 1,499 calories, and I'm still <laughs> under my 1,500 calorie mark. And, you know, if you look at the scheme of things, like, yeah, that is under your 1,500 calorie right. mark, so mathematically it should work out. but is that a diet plan that you can sustain? That's the question. If you're having one piece of pizza for lunch, are you going to be full on that enough to keep you to dinner? That's right. You know, and so what I think is interesting is it's really hard to lose weight without paying attention to what you're eating That's and right. making sure that you're getting nutrient-dense food. That's right. If you're eating a piece of pizza for lunch and a hamburger and fries for dinner, you're not getting really any nutrients, which means you're still going to have a lot of cravings. It means you're still going to be very hungry because your body craves foods with nutrients in them. And so um, a really good example I have is middle of the day, feeling hungry, kind of between that lunch and dinner, and you say, you know, I'm, I need a snack. And so right. let's say you go to the vending machine, get a little fun-sized bag of Fritos, all right, or Doritos, whatever your kind of favorite chips is, about 150 calories, all right? You may eat that, and maybe another hour, you're hungry again. Well, that same 150 calories, you can have an apple, a cup of carrots, a fourth a cup of like a low calorie dressing to dip the carrots in, and a full cup of strawberries. 
So which one are you going to be more full off of? That's you know, right. a couple of carrots, a couple of strawberries, an apple, and the calorie dressing, low calorie dressing, or this small fun size bag of Fritos. That's right. And the other part that you didn't even talk about that could extend this conversation is which one is better for our health, of mm -hmm. course, right? We know mm -hmm. that energy and the nutrients and so forth, but in the long haul, we know that one would take its toll on our overall health as exactly. well. Exactly. Very good. Exactly. Right, let's move on to the, the second one. This one has to do with uh, weight training versus mm -hmm. cardio. So talk to us about the myth and how, how you kind of correct that. Well, a lot of people say, um, you know, I'm, I just want to do cardio because I'm going to burn more calories doing cardio than strength training. That's right. So um, if you have a heart rate monitor or use the heart rate monitors on the equipment, it's true. If you do a 30-minute cardio workout, you may burn 300 calories, let's say, right. for 30 minutes. You do a 30-minute strength training workout, let's say you burn 200 calories. So you look at it and you say, well, that's a no-brainer. I'm going to do my cardio workout because I burn more calories. But what you don't see in that equation is the afterburn effect of when you're strength training, how many more calories you're going to burn after your workout. Where cardio workouts, you burn that many calories in that 30 minutes and then you're done. Where strength training workouts, strength training, the whole purpose of strength training is to break down your muscle to build it up stronger. Right. So your body needs energy and it's going to expend more calories throughout the day to recover from that hard workout from breaking out your muscle. That's right. So, and just a personal experience, um, I used to do a lot, a lot of cardio because I kind of had that myth too. Well, you know, I need to burn the most calories, so I'm yeah. just going to do a lot of running. And it wasn't until I got injured and couldn't run for you know seven or eight months that I really focused on strength training, and I saw a lot more improvement and a change of body composition, a lot stronger, um, and that was with barely any cardio. So obviously, the best you know pace scenario is going to be a combination of cardio and strength. But I think just focusing on just one or the other, you're not going to quite you know get the same effect. That's right, and also it kind of when people choose between one or the other, they often think that one is superior to the other, whereas they are actually both different. They both bring different benefits. Exactly. Exactly. Very good. Okay, let's move on to the the third one. Mm -hmm. um, let's come back to eating, and this one has to do with carbs and weight gain. Mm -hmm. Tell us about this myth. Well, the biggest myth, and it's across the board. Um, people think that carbs are bad, That's right. and I'm telling you, almost every person that I meet with or anybody I talk to in passing that says, you know, I, I'm going to lose some weight, I need to get off this holiday weight, um, I'm going to cut carbs. I'm going to go on a low-carb diet. It's always the first thing they think of is I need to take out all the carbs from my diet. Now, why is that? Why do, why do people say that's what they want to do? What, what about this myth or what about carbs specifically that makes so many people say this? And it's true, I hear this all the time as well. Mm -hmm. Well, I think the big thing that spun it was obviously the Atkins diet and thinking that carbs are bad for you, too much carbs, they have, you know, obviously high in sugar, they're going to spike your blood sugar up, you know, they're bad for you, you need to eat mostly protein, and it's across the board, it's from, you know, faculty and staff to students, to people just think carbs are bad, and, you know, and in general, I think the population does eat probably too many carbs, and so I think that people get that in their mind, well, I eat too many carbs, or right. people crave carbs, so they just think, you know, carbs are bad. And it could be a factor of just simply overeating, mm -hmm. right? Too many calories versus calories out. Yeah. And I think another reason why people believe this is a lot of times when people do go on a low-carb diet, they do lose weight initially. That's right. Um, and the reason why is because you're cutting out processed refined carbs, which probably shouldn't be in your diet in the first place, like cookies or crackers or chips or things that are processed that you know, you probably shouldn't eat anyway. So you take those out of your diet, and of course you're going to lose weight. That's a no-brainer. Right. But if you don't have any carbs, carbs are your main source of energy, you're going to feel really grumpy, really tired, really irritable. And so yep. you need to replace those processed, refined white carbs with good carbs. So you can still have the energy um, that you need from carbs, but without eating all the stuff that's processed. Now, let's, let's make a small list, or even a larger list, of what we would consider like wise choices that are carbohydrate or at least rich in carbohydrate. Mm -hmm. So go um, ahead. Anything Let's... that's like whole grain, think of like a wheat bread, dark bread, uh, bread brown rice. Yep. Um, and think of unprocessed grains too. So things if you look on their label only have one ingredient. So that'd be like oats, yep. like, like oatmeal, quinoa, yep. Yep. rice. It's just one ingredient on there. Yep. A really good tip I'd have for anybody who's trying to eat more whole grains is, or you know, more fiber rich whole grains instead of the processed carbs yeah. is to look at the fiber content on your nutrition label. That's right. And if it's be, you know, between five or six or even more, that's going to be a really great choice. It's a thumbs up. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's going to be your star choice. So like if you have oatmeal, like real oats, not the instant oatmeal, but real oats, right. quinoa, rice, all those are going to have five to six um, grams of fiber off the bat. 
And then some, some other foods, of course, uh, um, fruits go in this category. Mm -hmm. yep. Virtually all vegetables go in this category. Yep. Some have a little bit of protein and a little bit of fat mm -hmm. and so forth. But mm -hmm. those are all good choices that I think people instinctively know. In other words, when they're faced with a, a salad or um, a fruit-based dessert versus like a cake or pie-based dessert, mm -hmm. they know that the fruit fruit-based dessert is going to be better, it's going to be more nutritious. Mm -hmm. Those are good carbs, some of the ones that we name. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. And, and before we leave this um, particular myth, a study I read about people who are on the high protein diet found out that around one-third of all the weight loss was due to water because it, carbohydrates, interestingly, take a lot of water to be able to fully digest and absorb them. Mm -hmm. And if we do not have carbohydrates in our system, which, we, which is the case on a high protein diet, mm -hmm. the amount of water in our system is gonna be lessened. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the uh, outcomes of a high protein diet is that we lose weight for sure. So when we step on the scale, we're lighter, but research in this one study, for instance, I read, showed that about one third of all the weight loss was in water alone. Wow. And of course, we know we need water and we don't mm -hmm. necessarily want our water to be, or our weight loss to be in the form of water. Exactly, exactly. Okay, the, the uh, conversation about um, the high protein diet and water leads into our next myth. Uh, let's talk about um, water and how much we should take in per day. Mm -hmm. Take it from here. Well, the myth is that you, and everybody knows, you're supposed to drink eight glasses of water a day. And that's it is kind, kind of, of basic information, yeah, isn't it? Yeah, eight, eight ounces of glasses of water a day. And um, reality is people overestimate how much water they drink. Um, a recent study found that most people only drink about four cups of water a day. Um, but the reality is, even though they say eight cups, you really need about nine to 13 cups per day. And there's a couple of reasons why. Um, first reason is we're eating a lot more processed food these yep. days that has a lot more sodium in it that yep. you wouldn't even notice. Like if you have a lean cuisine meal for um, lunch, you're getting over 30% of your sodium right there. And a meal that doesn't necessarily taste salty, yep. um, if you have a piece of pizza, that's 20% of your sodium right there. Um, and in so one piece. In one piece, yeah. So, you know, rarely do you eat one piece of pizza. Maybe you have three and that's, you know, 60% of your sodium content right there. Or 13 in my case. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, or 13. <laughs> and that's not without putting all, you know, the dressings. Whatever's on yeah. the tight. <laughs> exactly. So, because we're eating so much more processed foods that have a higher sodium content, you really need more water to balance that out. Um, and also we're drinking a lot more drinks that are diuretics like coffee or energy drinks or tea right. or alcohol, things that make you actually go to the bathroom so you're losing water through that. Um, I think it's funny because people say, well, I, do, I drink all day, you know, I, don't, I drink all the time. But if you're having, you know, a coffee, which is a diuretic for breakfast and right. maybe a Coke for lunch or a sweet tea and an energy drink in the middle of the day, um, you know, where's, people say, I'm not thirsty. Well, you just need to replace things that you're drinking already with water. Sure. Um, my biggest thing is if you don't know if you're drinking enough water is to check your urine. If it's dark orange, you're not, you're very dehydrated. The sure. lighter it is in color, the better. Sure. Um, I did a, just a test on myself one day. I said, you know, I'm going to drink 13 glasses a day and I really want to do that. And just the increase in energy and I felt and just felt clear, not like brain fog. Yeah. It really helps you just feel a lot better. Um, so I just challenge anybody who doesn't know if they drink enough water to really try and drink that 9 to 13 glasses and see sure. how they feel. That's a great challenge, and we can leave the, the viewers with that very challenge. And mm -hmm. I do that with my students all the time, and I say there's a lot of things about a lot of people's diets that can be changed, mm -hmm. but start with what we, dr what we drink in a given day. Mm -hmm. And whatever we drink in the morning, whatever we drink in the afternoons and evenings that is not water, even for a couple days, mm -hmm. just substitute whatever you're drinking mm -hmm. with water and then just see how you feel. Mm -hmm. And of course, I think on most people, when they gauge that, their energy's better. Um, it's kind of like that fog is lifted. Mm -hmm. And I just think they ultimately feel better. And I think as much as anything, one of the reasons they feel better is just because they know they're making good choices. I agree, I agree. Well, good stuff. <laughs> uh, it's, it's been great having you back on the show, in fact, uh, we could easily have a uh, show two and three just about Miss Alone, couldn't yeah, we? Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> All right, so we hope you come back, Heather. Uh, stay tuned after the break. We'll have another member of the Wingate University community to discuss youth sports. <music> Welcome back to The Fitness Doctor. When people my age were young, much of our physical activity was driven by neighborhood football or baseball games, made up chase games, and so on. But today, much of our youth activity is supported by individual and team sports, sometimes year-round for the same activity. In such an environment, you have to have organization, money, and parental involvement, all of which can be positive, but can also make the experience not as great as it could be. 
Let's take a look, closer look at the good, bad, and ugly of youth sports. I'd like to welcome Dennis Johnson, professor of sport management here at Wingate University, back to the show. First, Dennis, tell us about your experience and background in youth sport. Well, thanks a lot. Thanks a lot for having me back on the show here. But as far as youth sport, you know, you, I see you were talking about raised in a neighborhood. I lived at the end of a dirt road on a farm. My nearest neighbor was like a half mile away. So, you know, I had to do a lot of my own, uh, you know, invite a couple guys over and play ghost games and, yeah. you know, baseball and things like that. But when I got in elementary school, this is when youth sport was really starting to take off. And, uh, you know, we would go out at lunchtime and recess and play softball. And I wanted to play baseball so bad, but my dad, I'm on the farm during the summer, never got to play Little League Baseball. Uh, he told me when I got into the uh, junior high, I could start doing sports. So, so my youth sport experience was limited to, to the playground during, during the school time or in the cow pasture with a couple of friends. Uh, a lot of benefits came from that. As you talked about uh, your experience playing in the streets and so yeah. on, we're, you know, we're older. We're, we're way older, and, and so, many th so many good things came from those experiences. Uh, and when we start moving into the youth sport realm of today, we, we lose some of those. Uh, you think back to when you were playing in the streets, if there was an argument, you settled it. So right. you, somebody was a leader, you know, you learned from one another. So or you, consensus. Or consensus, so you were a teacher. Uh, if things didn't go your way, you could pick up your ball and go home for a day, come sure. back the next day. You know, you weren't forced to be there. Uh, just so many things happen uh, of a positive nature forced to grow up in, in that environment. Uh, now we've moved into organized youth sport. Yeah. Uh, 50 million kids a year, about ages 18 down, participate in some kind of sport. So, and, and then you have to look at who's in charge of youth sport. When we, were, when we were doing what we were doing, we were the leaders, we made the rules. We made exceptions for kids that weren't as good as us, uh, four strikes, you know, things of this nature. Well, now, who's in charge? Parents. The parents. The parents are in, uh, in charge. And with that comes their rules, you know, their directives. Uh, we lose all autonomy. The, 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 the child playing the sport loses all that autonomy. Wait, and is, is there something good out of that, or is that just purely the the negative aspect of youth sport. Is there anything good about losing the, the, that autonomy? Uh, I would, I, I'm going to say that there are maybe those people say that you learn better skills, uh, but I would dispute that when I look at some of the youth sport coaches we have, when it's somebody's mom or pop who is only doing it because they want, A, they want to see their kid play, or uh, they're a disgruntled athlete from days gone by and they really don't know child development or techniques or tactics of the sport. So, you know, there's, there's a big loss there, I, I, I see. And of course, sometimes it's just simply because the parent is filling a void. Nobody else has stepped up and they're just doing it kind of out of the goodness of their heart to kind of keep the league right. going. And it's, in some cases, they do it even when their son is kind of graduated to the next level. And, and, so and you forth. have to admire those kind of parents if they are entering it with the, with the right uh, attitude. You know, we're going to let every kid play. We're going to play different positions. You know, it's about uh, child development, youth development, learning life skills, as opposed to I got to win. I, I got to win with this 10 year old. Yeah. You know, uh, a, a good example of this, and if the audience would like to see this, watch Kicking and Scream in the Will Ferrell movie. <laughs> Prime example of, of parents going over the edge with youth sport. Yeah. You know, betting on 10 year olds. I mean, come on now. <laughs> there's actual gambling that goes, I've well, yet to see that movie. There's gambling. You, you, it's <laughs> a movie every parent should see and don't be like that. Sure, sure. Now, um, a couple of things that uh, I wanted to address specifically is. Talk about the professionalism that has kind of conquered youth well, sport. Well, not professionalism, but professionalization. Professionalization. Uh, uh, you yeah. know, what it, what it is, they, they have tried to take youth sport and make it like the professional model. We have a, we have a World Series, you know. Uh, the Little League World Series, is that what you're No, I'm to? talking about the Big League World Series, you know, okay. the one that yeah. Chicago Cubs never make it to yeah, exactly. and, and things that is, that, you know. I'm aware. And yeah. the Detroit Tigers actually do. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so we, we, have, we have, you know, the Big League Professional World Series. Well, in 1938, this guy comes along and says, well, we're going to start a little baseball league. And it has evolved into a Little League World Series. That's a professional model. Yeah. I mean, when you're seeing ESPN put on four or five, six days of tournaments with, with uh, feature stories of 12-year-olds, 
That's a professional model. And some of their leading comment, you know, commentators and former professional athletes doing the commentary for and, them. And who is making the money off of that? It's not kids. The kids make nothing. You know, they get, they get maybe uh, one out of a hundred kids gets a trip to Williamsport. Probably more like one out of a thousand. Oh yeah. So, but, but, so who's being, who's being used? You know, there's no, Major League Baseball even has a players union to say what the players can and can't do. Little League, Little League players don't have that. No. They have nobody protecting them. Uh, you know, I, Dr. Uh, Tom Appenzeller, who used to be a professor here at the university, said, really, sports were never designed for kids. You know, play was designed for kids. And, and when, when you look at child labor laws, some of the things that are going on in youth sport, I mean, let's take, for instance, a child that gets up in the morning, goes two hours to swim practice before school, Right after school, he runs out and goes to soccer practice for another two hours. And then probably, if it's a female, maybe has gymnastics or dance after that. Yeah. You know, so you're looking at five, six hours a day, 30 hours a week. That's almost a full-time job. And plus, they're trying to be a kid. Yeah. So yeah. when we look at the professionalization of things, those are, those are the issues that you're really looking at. And parents out there watching this should really be careful about that. Um, as I said before, we, we may not have time to get into how we can make this all work, but I, I think this is a good show to make it, uh, make parents aware That's right. of what can happen here. Yeah. And the next time you come on, we'll talk about kind of like repairing the situation and what parents can and, do and what organizers can do to make it better for the all, all experiencing this. Right? right. Exactly. Because along with the professionalization, these next things you want to talk about are all really a result of that. For instance... Burnout? Burnout. And, and that, that, that's uh, kind of a segue from what you are just talking about, right? Anybody who practices for two hours doing anything, but on top of it, is maybe involved in multiple sports, they're just going to burn out physically, not just emotionally on one sport. But yeah. Talk yeah. a little bit more about well, that. Well, even the last time I was on, we were talking about the psychology of sport. But a kid that's you know, doing six hours, three or four different sports, you know, that, has, that takes a mental toll as well as the physical toll. That's right. But... You know, and they just get tired of it. And then by the time they get to be late high school or early college, when they want to be, when they should be really good, they're so tired of it. Their motivation is gone. You know, so and, and then they may have learned to like not like it so much, so they're not going to be physically active throughout life. Right. You know, uh, there are those who would maintain that youth sport is one of the leading causes for obesity in this country. And uh, let me tell you how that kind of works. Uh, you and I pseudo good athletes in college and we enjoyed physical activity well for every one of us there's probably uh i'd say maybe a hundred people who were the right fielders picking daisies yep. and didn't have a very good experience in youth sports so they feel embarrassed doing physical activity so as a result of their experience in organized youth sport they've chosen not to be physically active because it makes them feel their self-esteem is knocked down you know, just on down the line. So there are those that could make a case that youth sport actually is, is uh, enhancing our child obesity problem. Interesting. Most people don't think of it from that angle. You would never, you, most people would never think of it from that no, angle. No, they wouldn't. Now, we only have a, another minute or two here, but what is maybe uh, of the issues that we've talked about, What's the next issue you'd say is, uh, is as big as any within the world of youth sport? I, I'd say we have two issues to choose from. And like I said, we're going to have to talk about this again. Yeah. But it's a toss-up between the early specialization issue or the problematic parents. Now, both of those can be good, but, and both of them can be very bad. Uh, I think problematic parents, you know, normally if you have 10 parents, probably eight of them are pretty decent parents. They want the right things for their kids. You get the two that are wackos and maybe one in, in between there. Uh, but, you know, they're the kind of parents that want their kids specialized when they're five years old. Beat, you know, they, they watch the tiger, the tiger wood effect. They see him when he's two, yeah. three years yeah. old, and they, they want to see their kids do that. Yeah. I'd say probably those are the biggest issues. Now, uh, what we need to come back and talk on a later date is some of these countries that have developed long-term talent development programs where <clears throat> kids play multiple things and then they're lifelong enjoyers of physical activity, if that's sure. a word. Yeah. So um, talk about um, a little bit more about specialization. Use that word. Just kind of uh, <clears throat> well, you talk know about what that. it is. Uh, you know, 
every, every parent, or not everybody, I'm, I'm saying this too much, but a lot of parents feel like, you know, if I put my kid in this one particular sport, train him up, he's going to get a college scholarship. And that, that's what we're talking about. And how, just, how young does this start? Well, the way, age in some cases. there is it's four years old. Right? There is five the years. issue. Yeah, some of them five, six, seven years old. You know, they're they're putting them in gymnastics, and and that's where they stay. Or soccer. Soccer seems to be the big one. Yeah. Uh, I hear this uh, a lot. And, and I, I taught a grad class here a while back, and a mother in that grad class told me she had to take her kid down to the Charlotte uh, Tryout Center, wherever it was, eight o'clock at night. Her and this was this was like an eight-year-old for a travel team. And then they had to sit up until 11 o'clock at night to see if the kid made the team. And if he didn't make it, then he had to go back the next night and try out and then do the same thing. I mean, we're talking for eight-year-olds. Yeah. And, and, but she's got him in this program, and he's trying to specialize, and then she's going to keep doing that travel thing and then probably take him out of the other sports. The early specialization. Baseball's another one. It is. It's uh, You know, that. they're starting to go year-round with baseball. And, and it just leads to problems down the line. You know, we see uh, athletes with this elbow surgery, the Tommy John, with 12-year-olds now. Yeah. So, you know, the, the early specialization. Now, when do you specialize? And I think that's something that, you know, that's something that has to be worked out between the parents, the child. But if you look at uh, the Canadian long-term talent development, they're saying right around 14, 15, around in that area, specialize then. And uh, quite frankly, when I was in the Soviet Union a number of years ago, they said 16 is when they wanted their people to specialize. And they had a hard time deciding if a kid, if he was good, if he was going to be basketball, volleyball, or team handball. So, and they just figured they'd be world champ within the next four years after sure, that. Sure. So that's, those are the issues. And I, I think we need to, this is a topic that needs more talk. Because there are good things that can happen. For no, no question about it. In fact, uh, we've kind of... Um, you know, just focused in on the, the, on the negative. Bad, yeah, the bad and the ugly, and we didn't really focus on the good. So it sounds like, folks, we have a promise from our guests to be on again in the future to talk about the good of youth sport. Sure. Thanks, thanks for coming back, uh, Dennis. That's all we have time for. Um, thanks again for joining us on the, the program. I want to thank uh, Dennis as well as Heather Delange uh, for being guests on today's show. Join us uh, next time as we talk about the topics designed to help you stay fit and enjoy overall health. And remember, people don't stop playing because they get old. They get old because they stop playing. See you next time on The Fitness Doctor.